Hello and welcome to this lecture on training and development. The best companies and the best HR managers are always looking for ways to improve the performance of their employees. This can be done with compensation, done at the very beginning with selecting effective employees, and a variety of other ways. Most commonly though, HR managers improve the performance of employees with training and development. Let's get started. Training and development of employees is a critical function of HR and can provide a decided competitive advantage for firms who do it correctly. Of course, as with other HR functions, training and development is highly interrelated with the other HR functions. Think, for example, about recruitment. The availability of training can aid recruitment as recruits with minimal skills but a willingness to learn will apply to work for companies that will sponsor their training. Training and development affects selection because the availability of training may permit the hiring of less qualified applicants, but an effective selection system may reduce the amount of training needed by new employees. In the performance appraisal process, training and development aids in the achievement of performance standards, and the performance appraisal provides a basis for determining training needs. Regarding compensation management, Better training and development can lead to higher pay and compensation can then motivate training efforts. Lastly, for this very abbreviated list, in labor relations, a training program may include a role for the union in unionized workplaces. Union cooperation can facilitate training efforts. These are only some of the multiple ways that T and D intertwine with the other HR functions. Let's move on. There are several recommended steps in the implementation of a proper training and development program. The first and most critical step is a needs assessment. That is, we simply have to find out what our training and development, or T and D, needs are. This should start at the top of the organizational hierarchy and work its way down. First, we have an organization analysis, which is an examination of the environment, strategies, and resources of the organization to determine where training emphasis should be placed. For example, if the organization is thinking of expanding overseas or into a new industry altogether, it will likely need some cross-cultural training for the former and a host of training endeavors for the latter. Next, we have person analysis which is the determination of the specific individuals who actually need training and those who do not need it. That is, we decide who gets trained and who does not get trained, so we should consult our company's skills inventory and or the HRIS. As we work our way down from the top of the organization, we have to conduct task analysis, which is the process of determining what the content of a training program should be on the basis of a study of the tasks and duties involved in the job. In essence, it's a very detailed job analysis. In the case of an overseas expansion, we have to consider not only the implications of working in a foreign culture, but the possibility of an entirely new set of or types of jobs. For example, in some cultures, it's appropriate or even required that companies in negotiation engage in entertainment of prospective clients. This might even entail the need for a protocol agent or contracts with host guides in the host country. These are jobs not likely to be necessary here in the U.S. Not unrelated to task analysis is a competency assessment which is an analysis of the sets of skills and knowledge needed for decision-oriented and knowledge-intensive jobs. This sort of assessment of training needs is not required for all jobs, but it is essential for many high-level jobs which require decision-making. Such training programs include negotiation and conflict resolution classes, the development of skills in performance management, and the acquisition of skills in areas like teamwork and leadership. Let's move on. The next step is the consideration of various issues in the design of the training program. The first issue 
is that of the instructional objectives, which are the desired outcomes of a training program. In this phase, we decide what needs to be learned by trainees. It might be rudimentary math and reading skills, or it could be repair skills for the dreaded TPS machine, or classes on how to get along with people who are very different from ourselves. The second major issue is that of trainee readiness and motivation. Here, we screen prospective trainees for maturity and experience and seek trainees who are conscientious, self-disciplined, and goal-oriented. Even if someone needs remedial reading classes, they may not be ready for the class because of internal motivation or some such. Such people will likely feel that they've been singled out for training because they are somehow deficient in something and not necessarily see the training opportunity as an opportunity but rather as a punishment. I have separate slides for the principles of learning and the characteristics of successful trainers coming up. Let's move on. The various principles of learning are another issue to consider in training design. First, let's discuss goal setting based on Edwin Locke's goal theory. Not only should trainees have goals for what they want to learn, but trainers should have goals for what they want the trainees to learn. Individual differences in learners should be recognized so that programs can be designed to accommodate various learning preferences. Notice that I did not say learning styles. The whole concept of learning styles has been empirically debunked. In randomized controlled trials, people who profess to have a learning style performed just as well in different modes of teaching as did people who did not profess a style. Essentially, we may prefer to learn in one way or another, but we're equally adept at learning regardless of if the mode is visual, verbal, written, etc. Learning styles is not a thing. Active practice is important so that trainers can give frequent opportunities for learners to practice what they learn. Whole versus part learning is another principle of learning, and it is very important. Trainers should break down the material into manageable tasks and allow learners to master one small task before moving on to the mastery of the next task. Distributed learning is a principle that suggests that in most cases, spacing out the training periods will result in faster learning and longer retention. For example, in a college class, we could meet for 45 hours during one week or for three hours per week for 15 weeks. Clearly, the latter will result in better content mastery. Feedback is important to provide, especially in a timely manner, and can be self-monitoring or behavior modification, which is sometimes referred to as reinforcement. With self-monitoring, the learner should be able to determine for themselves if they performed well enough or not. For reinforcement, a reward can be given for appropriate performance and a punishment can be imposed for inappropriate performance. The use of modeling demonstrates the desired behavior that is to be learned. For example, watching someone operate a drill press or watching a baseball pitcher can give examples of good performance. And no, modeling is not giving Zoolander's blue steel look. Let's move on. The last issue of concern in training design regards the characteristics of a successful trainer. What makes a trainer successful? First, they should have knowledge of the subject. They don't necessarily have to be experts because many successful training programs rely on the experiences and input of the trainees, not just the trainer. But we shouldn't hire a monolingual speaker to teach a foreign language. So, some knowledge of the subject is definitely essential. Adaptability is the ability to alter the pace of learning for different trainees' learning ability. Not every learner learns at the same pace, so being able to fluidly control the pace of the training program is important. 
It helps if the group of learners is smaller rather than large for this, since slowing down 30 people because only one person cannot keep up might actually be problematic. Sincerity is important because the demonstration of tact in you is useful in addressing trainee concerns. Conveying the importance of the topic can reinforce it with learners. Having a sense of humor is important as well. Interspersing some light moments into a training experience can prove to be very useful. Having and giving clear instructions is imperative. Without clear instructions, a learner can become confused and dissatisfied. We know that being satisfied with the training experience helps learners learn more. Enthusiasm for the topic can be demonstrated by a dynamic presentation and the exhibition of a vibrant personality. Think for a moment about a class that you might have taken in the past for which the content was extremely boring. No, not this class. But when the professor was enthusiastic about the topic, it made it much more bearable for you, didn't it? Let's move on. I'll break down the third step into separate steps for non-managers and managers. On this slide, I'll focus on the former and take up the latter on the next slide. So here we're picking from a variety of training formats. Some lend themselves to certain topics better than others. First, we have on-the-job training, which is a method by which employees are given hands-on experience with instructions from their supervisor or another trainer. This is perhaps the most common form of training for non-managers, and sometimes it's pejoratively referred to as trial by fire, where we throw the employee into the mix and let them learn the job while performing the job. Of course, at least in the early part of their tenure in the job, the supervisor or someone with ample experience observes them closely so they don't mess up too badly. Two classic examples of OJT, or on-the-job training, are first the apprenticeship, which is a system of training in which a worker enters the skilled trades and is given training through instruction and experience, both on and off the job, in both the practical and theoretical aspects of the work. The second is an internship, which is a program often jointly sponsored by colleges, universities, and other organizations that offer students the opportunity to gain real-life examples and experience while allowing them to find out how they will perform in work organizations. For many inter interns, this is the stepping stone to a full-time career. Simulation training can be used for times when actual equipment is too expensive or too dangerous to actually use for practice. The classic example is the use of flight simulators for airline pilots in training. It's simply too risky and too expensive to let a pilot trainee land a 747. Sometimes simulations are conducted online by the use of avatars which are computer depictions of trainees which the trainee manipulates in an online role play. Other computer-based training involves the use of virtual reality that provides for an interactive three-dimensional learning experience. The Centers for Disease Control, for example, uses a virtual reality simulation for disaster response training in foreign lands where the people speak a different language the environment is very different, and the uncertainties are many times greater than here in the U.S. Of course, there's always classroom training, which is the most pervasive method in most educational settings. We're all familiar with that training method. This is an abbreviated list of possible training methods for non-managers, but before we discuss training for managers, let's think about how it is that we tie all of the training needs, training accomplishments, skills, etc. together. We use a learning management system, or LMS, which is a custom-built electronic database of these things which help us manage our needs and competencies. This is not a substitution for general needs assessment, but rather a tool that allows HR managers to implement and record training needs and trainee accomplishments.
Many college students are familiar with the LMS known as Canvas or Blackboard. Let's move on. When we think of training and development, we typically reserve the term training for non-managerial employees, and we use the term development to refer to similar efforts for managers. Here is an abbreviated list of some typical development programs for these managers. Many managers attend seminars and conferences where they seek to enhance their skill sets. Examples include sexual harassment seminars, which is an important management topic given the severity of the experience for many of the aggrieved and the tremendous cost to companies that do not handle it well. Case studies are often used for management development, similar to the case studies used in business school. These cases seek to enhance managers' analytical, problem-solving, and critical thinking skills on topics pulled from actual events. Some firms use management games which require active participation and are often computerized. In these sorts of games, participants will juggle firm resources and make managerial decisions about the use of the resources in the hopes of optimizing the fictitious firm's performance. It tends to show how labor, raw materials, advertising, employee strikes, etc. are all intertwined. Also, there's behavior modeling, again, not the modeling by Derek Zoolander. Behavior modeling is an approach that demonstrates the desired behavior and gives trainees the chance to practice those behaviors and receive feedback. Many times it involves the viewing of videos in which a manager models the appropriate behavior when dealing with an employee. And then the trainee practices the behavior by engaging in some role play. The trainer then gives feedback and reinforcement to the trainee. Let's move on. Well, after we've trained managers and non-managers, we need to determine if the training was effective. One way to do this is to gather reactions to the training, which is simply a critique of the instructor and the program and what you learned or did not learn. It should give some insight into the content and the techniques that trainees found useful, as well as highlight some areas for improvement in the training program and the trainer. Another way is to measure learning by giving a pretest and a post-test to assess actual learning from the program. In the college classroom, this would be like taking the final exam on the first day of class and then again at the end of the semester. A measure of learning is the difference between the two scores. Of course, the pretest would usually be a low stakes test since it probably shouldn't count towards a student's grade. So the incentive to perform well on it is really absent. In the working world, a high enough pretest score could demonstrate that the trainee really doesn't need to take the training class and spending money on them would be useless. Behavior on the job is the gold standard of training criteria. It involves training transfer, which is an application of what is learned in a program and then transferred to the conduct of the job. Training transfer is the most important criteria and should be the goal of every training program or method. There are also some related ways to evaluate training programs with their results being analyzed with utility analysis, which assesses the benefits relative to the cost, and by benchmarking, which compares training practices against industry leaders according to trainee activity. That is, how much training are we doing? Training results, that is, does our program achieve its goal? And training efficiency, which asks what resources are used to pursue training goals. And with benchmarking, we can compare our results to others in our industry. Let's move on. Here are a few specialized training programs that almost all firms use or should use, depending on their mission and business focus. The first is new employee orientation, which is a formal process of socializing newcomers. All companies with more than a few employees have some sort of formal orientation program. 
That is where new employees learn a bit about the history of the firm, some key policies of the firm, as well as getting information about their choices regarding employee benefits, etc. Because the U.S. is such a heterogeneous nation in which to do business, we often have training for diversity. Such training programs are usually of two types. The first type is awareness training, which is intended to show the benefits of diversity for the firm. The second is a skill building program intended to provide the KSAOs for working with people who are different. Now, given the possibility of terrorist threats and active shooters in the workplace, amongst other potential crises, many firms engage in crisis prevention training, which involves not only emergency response training, but safety and contamination training, all of which are designed to make the workplace as free from harm as possible. For firms who operate abroad, global training is important. Many firms who place their employees in overseas operations have expatriate training and readjustment as well as international protocol courses. It's important to train people on how to get along in a foreign land, how to adjust to life back in the U.S. after returning, and some do's and don'ts regarding living abroad. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all for now.